Hey everyone, Will Fauche here. It's been a while since my last video. I've had a lot going on and I've got some pretty exciting new content in the works and coming soon in Unreal Engine. So uh, yeah, stay tuned. But today we're talking about 3D scanning. If you've ever been disappointed by the results of your photogrammetry, you're not alone. But fortunately, you don't always have to go out and buy the latest and greatest cameras or lenses. There are a bunch of free things you can do, good practices you can use to get the most out of the gear you have. So toward the end of this video, we will talk a little bit about hardware, but I will not be recommending specific cameras. It'll be more about what things to look out for when you are choosing cameras or lenses for you. Now, full disclosure, this video is sponsored by Capturing Reality, and all of the scans shown here have been done with Reality Capture. So really, getting better scans boils down to two main things. First off is you, the photographer, the person behind the camera. And secondly, hardware. If you're an absolute beginner to photogrammetry, I recommend watching these two videos first to get a better grasp of how 3D scanning works to begin with. So let's start off with the free solution. And really the key term here is good data set. We need to talk about what we call coverage. This is one of the most important concepts of photogrammetry. The generation of your 3D model is based on the pictures you take, right? It's critical that they are taken at regular intervals, covering the entirety of your subject. Follow the shape of your object you're scanning, and you may need to shoot more photos depending on what you're shooting. Anything that has small nooks and crannies and cracks like this here will need smaller and more numerous increments between photos. This may seem really obvious to anyone who's done photogrammetry before, but you would be surprised by how many people overlook this. That brings us to overlap, and this kind of works together with coverage. So generally, the more overlap between photos, the better it is. I've said 60% overlap in the past, but 80% is not too much. So just pay attention right here between these two photos. There is an entire segment, this gap here, that's not being captured. And as a result, Reality Capture will not be able to reconstruct that model correctly. You're going to need to take additional photos, especially on small gaps like this. So really keep that in mind. Next, when you're shooting, try not to shoot panorama style photos. And what I mean by this is standing still in one place and taking more photos by only pivoting your camera up and down from the same position. Always try to move around the object and change the camera's position as you can see here. Shooting panorama style images causes very inaccurate 3D model generation. Avoiding this will give you the best possible alignment in reality capture. So just take a look at this comparison here to see what I mean. The example on the left is a lot worse despite having the same amount of photos taken. Whereas on the right, the model is a lot cleaner. So I've been guilty of shooting panorama in the past, so don't feel bad, now you know. Next, always shoot raw photos if you can. Most cameras will shoot raw in a full 14 bits of data to capture way more detail in the shadows and highlights that can be recovered. So it also allows you to change the white balance of an image without deteriorating your photos at all. It's totally non-destructive. This is very important. Because while JPEGs will look fine when you're looking at them on your phone, they really start falling apart the moment you start doing any kind of serious shift in colors or values. Banding will appear and introduce all kinds of really nasty artifacts. Just take a look at this photo right here, which is a JPEG. And if I try to lift the shadows and recover those highlights, we introduce a ton of banding and unwanted crap. But editing the raw file and doing the same thing, you're going to see we have zero banding issues, a nice clean image that can be edited non-destructively. Once we have edited our files though, and we have made the corrections we want to make to them, we can export them as JPEGs into Reality Capture. That is okay. RAW really just helps us with the editing and squeezing out as much data from your shots. The data set here is what is important, all right? Now, if you're using a mirrorless camera, you're going to want to avoid using what's often called a quiet or electronic shutter. That isn't good because it introduces what we call rolling shutter. 
more commonly known as the Jello effect, and it can really warp your images in a way that Reality Capture or Photoshop cannot correct. As a result, it will mess up your scan. Notice how things warp and bend when I rotate the camera like this. This is the photo that was taken with the electronic shutter on, and look how warped it is. Bear in mind, this is an extreme example that I use to demonstrate the effect, and this is not usually a problem since both you and your subject should not be moving when you're scanning 3D models. But we want to factor out anything that could potentially mess up your data. Keep in mind, you probably don't get rolling shutter on extremely high-end cameras like the Sony A1 or the Nikon Z9, which have insane readout speeds, but most people are not using those cameras. Hey, Future Will here. One thing I see people struggling with is getting lumpy objects like this. Regular photogrammetry works best with very matte objects that have lots of feature points, objects that have little to no specular shine to it. Shiny, reflective objects will turn out messy like this. I see people struggling with this all the time. If your object is shiny in any way, you will need cross-polarization to help you out. And this video here will help you with that. Now next, do not shoot video for photogrammetry. Because I know what you're thinking. Instead of taking one photo after another after another, it's very tedious when you could just press the record button and move the camera and get a whole bunch of photos. It sounds great in theory, but video is usually compressed. It lacks the resolution, the bitrate is lower, chroma subsampling affects the data set, but most importantly, Video rarely uses the full sensor readout. And what I mean by this is most sensors actually have an aspect ratio of 3-2. But when you shoot video, it's often 16-9 and it crops out parts of your frame and you're losing information. This will negatively affect the distortion correction that apps like Reality Capture apply to your image under the hood. Some cameras also use a technique called pixel binning or line skipping to record the video in 4K and that's not good because it is literally deleting pixels. You're losing critical data. So TLDR, don't use video for photogrammetry unless you absolutely know what you're doing. If you're using a Sony A1 or the Nikon Z9, both of these cameras shoot raw 8K video, which is insane. So if you do have means of dealing with the sheer amount of data that that's going to write to disk, that's fine. But again, most people are not using those cameras. So if you're an average mortal like myself, just avoid shooting video for photogrammetry purposes. Now, I've said this before in literally every other photogrammetry video I've ever made. Ensure flat, even lighting, but try to shoot in flat lighting, like overcast days and such. Simply due to the fact that any kind of lighting will be baked into the texture detail of our scan, flat lighting will ensure a more neutral result that can be way more useful to us as a 3D artist. Flat lighting means you don't need to spend too much time delighting your textures for use in a PBR workflow. Next, avoid AI upscaling. So photogrammetry is very dependent on high resolution images, right? The more resolution and detail you have in your data, the better the scan. But up photos with apps like Topaz Photo AI or Photoshop Super Resolution is not going to make your scans better. In fact, it will actively make them worse. Now, I'm not saying that Topaz AI is bad. In fact, I use it myself for other purposes and it's an amazing tool, just not for photogrammetry specifically. Just, just, just don't. If you're taking photos with the phone, make sure you avoid any kind of computational photography. Tools like HDR or electronic zoom or low light mode. This is because some cameras with small sensors use a kind of photo bracketing or sensor shift super resolution to artificially upscale the real resolution of your sensor. You will get better results by using the native resolution of the sensor without any fancy tricks or under the hood hacks. You wanna use your native sensor's abilities. And this is why better cameras tend to give you better scans because as a result, better, more expensive cameras tend to have larger sensors and the bigger the sensor, the better the image quality, up to a point. Now for the juicy part, the hardware, the gear, the toys of our trade. Like I said, photogrammetry relies heavily on resolution and sharpness of the photos. This will naturally imply that higher resolution cameras like 24 or 36 megapixels or more 
is best. As a result, such high-res cameras really need good lenses in order to be able to resolve that kind of detail. The order of priority when it comes to gear in general is as follows. Lights, lenses, and camera last. You don't want to have a high-end, super expensive camera only to put a cheap lens on it. Good lighting is imperative, and there's a reason why I put this first on the list. Now, of course, overcast days are free and don't cost anything, but using artificial light to help you is incredibly useful, as I've demonstrated in this video here, where I use that ring flash to almost completely overpower bright sunlight. Now, lenses are arguably way more important than a camera because you want a lens that is tack sharp, well corrected for things like chromatic aberration. Prime lenses are perfect for this. And for those of you wondering what a prime lens is, it's a lens with a fixed focal length, so there's no zoom. A good focal length to use is 35 millimeters, full frame equivalent, and that gives you a pretty decently wide shot to work with. Some people use other focal lengths like 50 millimeters or even 105 millimeters, depending on the subject. 35 millimeters, though, is a safe bet. I myself shoot with the Sigma 35 millimeter 1.4 art lens right here. Now, I notice a lot of people saying that the lower the f-stop, the better it is for low light, which is true. But when it comes to photogrammetry, fast lenses with low f-stop numbers are largely irrelevant because you need to stop down to something like f8 or f12 to scan objects anyway because of depth of field. Fast lenses with an aperture of 1.4, 1.8, or 2.8 are pretty much gone to waste because you don't need it. So as long as the lens is sharp, lenses with an aperture of f4 or 5.6 or higher are totally fine to get. Now, it's a bit of a weird dichotomy because even though we don't need the f1.4 aperture, those expensive fast lenses tend to be really good lenses, and they tend to be professional lenses. So yeah, just get what's within your budget. Lastly, like I said, the camera. Personally, I would spend more money on lenses than cameras, as lenses often tend to make a bigger impact on the final output than the camera body does. Up to a point. If you put a fancy lens on a potato, yeah. I myself shoot with two cameras. I got the Nikon Z6 II right here and the Nikon D800 at 36 megapixels of resolution. The D800 is over 10 years old at this point, and somehow it's still a very highly relevant camera today. This just goes to show you that you do not need to shell out serious cash on the latest and greatest most expensive camera. You can, of course, buy an expensive camera because that's exciting and fun, but I urge you to consider buying secondhand. Buying used gear allows you to get some pro-level gear for a fraction of the cost, and chances are you are not going to outgrow it in a few years. If you can afford it, try to get a full-frame camera as they are the most well-rounded and offer amazing low-light capabilities, great dynamic range, good color. That said, full-frame is not an absolute necessity. APS-C Micro Four Thirds are absolutely awesome as well. There are plenty of incredible cameras with those smaller sensors, and they will be way better than any smartphone you use. And now there's one last thing to talk about, and that is this video's sponsor. So a big thank you to CG Spectrum for sponsoring this video. CG Spectrum is a global top-ranked training provider offering specialized courses in real-time 3D, game development, animation, VFX, and digital painting. They're an Unreal Authorized Training Center and Unreal Academic Partner, and their courses include personalized mentorship from industry professionals. I helped develop their real-time 3D technical and virtual production course, and here are just a few examples from some of my students. If learning Unreal Engine with the help of an industry mentor is something you're interested in, check out the link below or visit cgspectrum.com for more info. You'll get the most practical and up-to-date knowledge, connections, skill, and industry awareness that studios in both the games and film industry are hiring for. So guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Again, like I said, I've got some really exciting videos coming soon, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss those. We've got some more Unreal Engine tutorials on the way. So hang tight and see you soon.